Hello friends. So last time we had looked in figures of speech, personification, metaphors and simile. Today we are going to continue with the remaining ones. So let us look at the examples. Uh, very simple and uh, often uh, we have learned this, used it. When we were children we used to enjoy singing this twinkle twinkle little star. Okay, this is a statement which is taken, a dialogue taken from the gingerbread man. Run, 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 as fast as you can. You can't catch me, I am the gingerbread man. This is from the very famous The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. Now what do we look at uh, when we are looking at these highlighted words? We see that there is some sort of writing the word, same, similar word, same word again and again. Now such kind of phrases or words would be called as figure of speech of repetition. So what is repetition? Repetition is repeating the words or phrases as we saw in the example. It's a rhetorical device. It is uh, actually to be repeated for the purpose of persuading and motivating the person who is reading or the person who is listening to. Why does the writer does this? So that there is a stress put on that piece of writing and the meaning is not literal only but also conveying something which is um, which is metaphorical in nature and uh, there is an intention to bring about that change of thought or change of uh, perspective through that repetition. Especially in public speaking we find that very good orators use this idea of repetition because they want to sink in the idea that they have thought of public should know or public should start believing in. It allows the speaker to emphasize and uh, it also helps the speaker to imprint his or her words in the mind of the listener or in the minds of the reader because that is what the speaker or the writer wants the listener or the reader to understand. Uh, especially in storytelling we see that repetition helps, uh, helps us to remember the details of the story. If again and again there is some kind of dialogue is repeated, we uh, remember it forever. Similarly, you will find in um, songs also, when some things are repeated, some words or phrases are repeated again and again, every time we are singing a song, we find that those words are the ones that come into our mind immediately. Then uh, the stories for young readers have repeated lines. Okay. Now, they stretched in never ending line along the margin of a bay, then thousands saw I at a glance. This is from Daffodils. It's a very uh, known poetry to everyone who has uh, studied English in school. And sometime between 8th standard to 10th standard, this poem comes. It's a nature poem written by William Wordsworth. And we find that uh, the poem has lot of uh, such kind of statements which help us, you know, to visualize what the poet is actually trying to say. So, some more. There was a fire storm out there. Dresden was a big flame. Dresden is the name of a city. Okay. The one flame ate everything. Organic. Everything that could burn. This is from Slaughterhouse 5. Now such kind of statements which are written in such a manner that they help the reader to visualize what the writer is trying to say. The writer is not making a painting as in an actual fine art painting but is trying to paint that picture or scenario or event that he or she is trying to describe. Such kind of uh, 
statements we find mostly in novels also in fiction also we can see pride and prejudice jane austens uh you were the last man in the world whom i could ever be prevailed on to marry you were the last man in the world so actually it is not that the person would be the last man but it is just to make things more visual for the reader such kind of statements would be called as hyperbole okay so what are hyperbole exaggeration for the sake of emphasis we want to emphasize on an idea we want to exaggerate an idea make the speakers uh, readers visualize that idea and therefore we use hyperbole they are very obvious those statements are very obvious that it may not be like this literally but there is a point which is being emphasized Uh, because of its ability to express larger than life emotion hyperbole is very commonly used in novels and poetry politics and advertising slogans so many advertising slogans we see and uh, we find that there is lot of exaggeration done on the idea of uh, whatever is being sold uh, for example we have seen a very famous ad and which is uh, which brings in or sings in as the social uh, idea of uh, ariel uh, when the child helps or is trying to help to remove a tree and then finally the slogan comes in kuch daag acche hain so that is a hyperbole that is used in hindi there was no hurry for there was no way to go nothing to buy and no money to buy it with nothing to see outside the boundaries of maycomb county this is from to kill a mockingbird uh, written by harper lee and we see that there is uh, the writer is trying to show the emotion of nothingness of loneliness of feeling alone of feeling uh, sad and that is how that uh, uh, statement is made where there is no hurry there is nowhere that you know i can go so there are different examples of hyperbole that can be structured very differently depending on the sentence it can be in a poem it can be in a um, story it can be in a speech dialogue Uh, what is essential in hyperbole is not how that the sentence is structured but whether the exaggeration is uh, really purposefully done does it create that strong feeling or impression or emphasizes a point that the writer wants to bring in okay so now we move on to next very famous one it's there in our constitution preamble as well of the people by the people and for the people first given by abraham lincoln next uh, shakespeare is the passionate pilgrim a doubtful good a gloss a glass a flower lost faded broken dead within an hour to win the war secure the peace and earn the respect of the world this was barack obama's speech when he was fighting for the presidential seat then martin luther's speech i have a dream let freedom ring from stone mountain of georgia then he moves on let freedom ring from lookout mountain of tennessee then again let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of mississippi and from every mountain side let freedom ring can you see the uh, movement of the words how it is moving from a lower level to a higher level so such kind of words or phrases could be called as climax so what is climax climax is basically the words which are successive in nature that is moving one step ahead they are uh, moving in ascending order of importance uh, they could be words phrases clauses or sentences but the importance of the words increases one after the other as the sentence moves on why it is done it is to build an excitement or something that the listener or the reader is anticipating okay now what now what now what that kind of feeling uh, comes in it can be used in speeches novels plays 
uh, this climax that is the figure of speech climax is different from the climax that we generally talk in a plot or a story where the climate is where the central conflict of the story reaches its peak this climax literally may mean that but actually the figure of speech is the use of words to build up the emotion and excitement whereas in a story it is the event that we uh, look at uh, language gives a feeling of mounting intensity with a successive word phrase or clause Uh, something can only be called a climax if the tension is built over the course of three or more discrete words so one word cannot uh, uh, make something a climax it has to be in succession that a few words are spoken the words have a hierarchy of importance or power and uh, we see that whenever we see such kind of statements we understand that okay after this the next step should be this so that was climax now just the opposite of it we look at for god for country and for ale uh, see the succession of the words he has seen the ravages of war he has known natural catastrophes he has been to single bars he lost his family his job and his house plants can you see the succession this is just the opposite of climax that is moving in a down order descending order and therefore the word is also very self explanatory anti climax just the opposite of it so what is anti climax it's the opposite of climax it has a very comic effect like i lost uh, my family okay family is a bigger thing lost my job less bigger and then the flower plants at home so it is something which is of no value at all therefore it subverts the listener's expectation by placing the least important thing at the end of the list where uh, we would want somebody to speak uh, start from the minor ones to the major ones this is the opposite you go from an important one to the least important some examples of anti climax are intended to be funny and some are funny without even intending it to be for example he tripped at the top of the stairs fell down the whole flight banged his head and died broke his glasses too so this is very important till died you know like somebody falls down and then what is the least important thing broke his glasses too so can we see the contrast can we see the fun the comic effect of it so words are arranged in ascending order of importance with a sudden shift at the end uh, which is uh, unimportant which doesn't have any value would be also anti climax okay he has passed away she is between jobs look at the words that are describing the uh, person she has resigned her commission he is a little thin on top this preloved sofa is for sale euphemism why it is euphemism or why these words are called euphemism look he has passed away he did not pass 6 standard 7 standard 10 standard he passed away from the world she is between the jobs that there are two jobs in between there is nothing and she is there so she is unemployed okay Uh, he is a little thin on top so uh, on top is our head and it is thin so there is baldness that the person is being spoken of so it's a mild or a polite or a vague word or indirect word or expression that is substituted for one and considered to be too harsh otherwise or very blunt but when said in that mild uh, way uh that embarrassment is lessened that uh, unpleasant feeling is lessened when it is said like this and then we are talking of again shakespeare comes in sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears and sometimes voices it's from the tempest we heard the vroom of the car's engine as it whizzed by and screeched around the corner can you see the words the boom of a firework exploding the tick tock of a clock and the ding dong of a doorbell are all examples of onomatopoeia onomatopoeia so 
these are sounds if you see the words that are denoting some sound so what is an onomatopoeia the word that evoke the actual sound of a thing which is described onomatopoeia can be real words it can be made up words or it can be just the letters to represent that raw sound for example z would be like sleeping or snoring okay advertising branding and slogans often use onomatopoeia snap crackle pop these are the words that are uh, giving us a feel of that sound so snap that means something breaks crackle something is breaking in glass pop that sound comes in of something opening onomatopoeia can differ across the cultures for example uh, a dog's woof in english is a dog's paw in italian so that can also be something which uh, we can say differs from culture to culture because it is sound there are some more variations look at this look at the repetition of the word which is giving the feel of the sound especially when we see the word bells how many times it has been repeated this is edgar allan poe's the bells it's a poem in which he repeated the word bell 62 times so that when somebody is reading that that sound of bell ringing and tolling is evoked in the mind of the person so real words made to evoke the sound of the real things would be called as onomatopoeia then real words that sound like real thing for example meow which sounds like a cat so the cat and meow goes together um made up words sounds like real things for example i was just beginning to yawn with nerves thinking he was trying to make me make a fool of me when i knew his tatterat at the door this is from ulysses by james joyce and uh, uh, this is the first time that uh, such kind of word came in which helped us to uh, to visualize or imagine the sound of a door opening then a series of letter that mimic a raw sounds achu or or uh, tat tat these are some sounds which otherwise do not have any meaning to it but when spoken in the context we are able to visualize and sometimes even listen in our mind the audio or the uh, sound that thing would make so this is what we uh, have done in this figures of speech series we have seen all these figures of speech what are the examples and uh, what do these figures of speech denote and what is the reason for having such kind of uh, figures of speech especially figures of speech are used to emphasize on our feelings more than it would have been done through a simple statement and therefore Uh, when we want to make our writing more effective figures of speech is a very good um, uh, you can say uh, it it is a very good tool for us to make our literature more impressive more empathetic more visual and sometimes it also brings in the effect of sound like we saw earlier so thank you for this uh, session thank you all